Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I really um, I appreciate being invited. Um, it's, um, yeah, it would have been lovely to do this in person, but here we are, you know, <laughs> and uh, yesterday was a very special day in that the, there was a judgment against Derek Chauvin, um, the police uh, man who murdered um, George Floyd. And uh, it's, it's been a turmoil of a year and I feel like it's sort of like a conclusion. Hope, I mean, I know it's not an end because a lot has to happen, but, um, but it is a conclusion to one very tumultuous year and that really resulted in this body of work and kind of led me down a path that was unexpected actually. Um, so anyway, I, I wanted to preface that because um, it's, it feels like about a year ago we were talking uh, about doing this talk and it's interesting that it's happening today um, so soon after the, um, the jury made that decision. So I'm gonna start the share here. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Um, just gotta find it here. Oh, it's on the side. Okay, I'm gonna find it. Share screen. Okay. I'm doing a. Um, um, uh, let's see. Sorry. My small screen gets cut off, so, so it's hard to show things sometimes. Okay, so this first image um, is uh, Concepcion, Chile, and. Uh, my first time going to Concepcion was in 2005. I took a group of students. Uh, and can everyone see this? Is this working? Let's see, just wanna make sure. Yes, okay. Uh, so anyway, um, yes. So I, uh, my first time in Concepcion was 2005. I took a group of students. Uh, the reason St. Cloud State chose this particular city as a sister city for St. Cloud was that um, the two towns are like the Twin Cities and Concepcion are similar size. And so they, they thought students wouldn't be overwhelmed by some gigantic city. Um, so I have this history of returning to this place that's like a sister city to Minneapolis. Um, so it was very strange because last year, basically, I saw both cities uh, in turmoil, complete turmoil. Um, and so the way, uh, this is Concepcion downtown. Uh, you can see this young woman just walking her, you know, towards a water tank. Um, you can also see how the, the painting, uh, you know, the, the splatters of colored paint on the water tank. Um, it's incredibly expressive, almost like an abstract expressionist painting. Um, and all the tanks have this kind of character. They, they've been beat up. They have a history of, of the, unrest. Um, but it, but when I showed up in this last uh, January, well, December, yeah, January 2020, I, I did a trip to Chile. Um, I had planned this trip before I knew about the unrest um, that was happening there. So it was quite a shock to land uh, in the city in its, in its current state. Um, Anyway, I will get back to this, but I'll be reading a little bit from pages. So if I look down, don't, never mind. But so uh, in November 2019, riots broke out as a result of a subway fare hike. Um, it was a violent response. Um, the violent response from the government led to a general uprising that reflected the satisfaction with neoliberal policies that have resulted in growing inequality. So the, the unrest was actually uh, all through Chile, every town, every city. Uh, so it wasn't just Concepcion. Uh, this is George Floyd Square, so 2020. Um, and I live about 10 blocks from here. So this is my neighborhood. Um, so soon after I returned to Minneapolis from Chile, George Floyd was killed by Derek Chauvin, resulting in massive protests in my neighborhood. When I experienced the protests in Chile, I returned to the US thinking that unrest would likely flare up in the US due to rising inequality, but I never imagined it would happen so soon and in my backyard. Uh, so you know, there were clues that unrest would be possible or, or that it was becoming a global 
problem. And I think it's, it, it's clearly tied to climate change in some ways, but also to um, like uh, when I was in Chile during the unrest, I saw uh, a lot of tactics being used that were the same tactics that got used in Hong Kong. So there was something about that global outreach uh, between activists that made me think, okay, I think the US is probably primed for a similar outbreak. Obviously in this case, it, it, the trigger was uh, racially uh, motivated, unlike in, in other cultures where it's more, it's uh, governments and uh, oppression from, from governments. Okay. So I made this flag a few days after George Floyd was killed. Um, I it was really distressing to experience uh, your, you know, to see your neighborhood burn and just, and I, I actually have not watched the video uh, of the death. Um, it's, though I've seen, you know, I've read transcripts and I know uh, I've heard the, you know, the, the witnesses give accounts. So I feel like I, I, I have it engraved in my head. Um, but uh, the dual pain of it was uh, consisted of the fact that uh, um, this day was my father's 85th birthday. So, so it was like the same day that my, that we're celebrating sort of, you know, my dad reaching a pretty elderly age and COVID. Uh, he lives in Argentina, so he's very far away. So, I, you know, I, I can't, like he was having health issues and I was like, I can't visit. Um, so that combined, you know, that, that, that sharing of that date was quite meaningful to me and I felt I needed to do something. Um, and so this flag is, was really for myself. I, I don't, I, I don't have an intention to, of showing it because it, it sort of was just a personal way of dealing with this pain. Um, so it's the day that George Floyd was killed with his name. Um, by now the word Anthropocene, anthropo means human, uh, has been incorporated into common usage. It is used to refer to current geologic age, uh, viewed as the period during which human activity has been the dominant often destructive influence on climate and the environment. And I'll come back to this idea. So I'm gonna jump into this project that I just finished. Uh, uh, so this exhibition closed April 27th. So just uh, recently, <laughs> I'm still dealing with the documentation of it, um, but I'll, I'll give a little background. So no me acuerdo, uh, which translates to, I don't remember land, so uh, No Me Acuerdo Land is a poem. And so it's basically the title is No Me Acuerdo Land. I was trying to do Spanglish, but um, the title for this exhibition is based on a poem by Maria Elena Walsh, and it's from 1967. Uh, she's an Argentinian poet singer who wrote children's songs that I grew up singing with my siblings. So, I, and I'm gonna read the translation because I think it's, uh, it's sort of, became an important piece in putting together the exhibition, the installation. Uh, so in the country I don't, re of, I don't remember land, I take three steps and I'm lost. One little step over there, did I take it? I can't say. One little step further, oh fright, I'm so scared. In the country of I don't remember land, I take three steps and I'm lost. One little step backwards, I dare not step further because I have forgotten again where I, where I placed my other foot. In the country of I don't remember land, I take three steps and I'm lost. So for me, this, uh, this poem, um, it, well, the, it, its history uh, is tied to the, disappear, the disappeared during the dirty war in Argentina um, in the late 60s, 70s. Um, but, uh, but for me, it also uh, is about this idea of like when you immigrate to a new place and it's sort of the landscape stays with you. I grew up in the Patagonia of Argentina. And so I define myself through that landscape. And yet uh, in, it, it's like a memory of it. And, um, and sometimes I doubt that place. I, I'm not sure if it's there. It's sort of this doubting and wondering if you know what's there. But it also, so it's about immigration and this idea of not belonging anywhere. So, you know, it's like you go forwards, you go backwards, where do you belong? Where, you know, where is home? Um, so that, that's why I wanted to name it that. 
2017, I went to, uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park in the Big Island, Hawaii. Uh, I was interested because uh, the Kilauea volcano was uh, particularly active at that point. Um, and it was encroaching on uh, Pahoa village, a small village in the Big Island. And so it was, you know, it was risking damaging, like it damaged some of the infrastructure. It had crossed the road. It was, it burnt a few buildings and homes. Um, but so the, this powerful force of the volcano, um, I was fascinated by, and I, I thought, oh, this is interesting. This is like, uh, almost like a, um, I wanted to be there and see sort of this clash of the human made with uh, a natural force, uh, such as a volcano. So I went there and I, uh, as it turned out, I wasn't really, it, you know, I couldn't get near any actually moving lava, but I was able to hike on many lava fields and it was just an incredible experience. Um, so I wanted to reanimate the lava. And so I did this, or I attempted to do this by doing this dye sublimation prints. And I printed these at Alfred uh, with the help of Miles Calvert, what, who was at the time the visiting, um, he was a, a, a visiting printmaking professor. And uh, so with, with, you know, the two of us did these uh, really large prints. Uh, and there are photographs from my hikes in Kilauea uh, and National Park, uh, Volcanoes National Park. So the idea was to, I printed it on chiffon. Uh, so it's a photograph that gets transferred by heat using heat onto fabric. And it's, uh, so the, it actually turns the dye into a gas and uh, it, the fabric absorbs it. So it's actually uh, permanent and you can actually wash it and it's, it's, it doesn't go away. Um, but I wanted these to have that light airy quality so the fabric allowed the lava to move again, it reanimated it, but also reflected its fragility. Uh, so I was interested in this sort of uh, middle place where the lava is both destructive, but also um, regenerative. Um, and, but also that even though it feels very powerful, um, it's, it's not really, um, human forces are equally powerful in a maybe, uh, or equally destructive in a different way. So, so the clash of the two. Um, and this is a, a direct picture of the lava as it would look as a photograph. Uh, here's just a, a, a installation shot. I really didn't have an intention of making such a ambitious exhibition installation in South Minneapolis, <laughs> but uh, I did a artist residency in California uh, at the ski resort, resort town, a ski town called Mammoth Lakes. So these two artists started a residency and invited me like in 2018. So I did a lot of um, hiking in the Eastern Sierra and, and became acquainted with that landscape. Um, and we kept talking about having an exhibition and it kept getting postponed, you know, first because I went to Alfred, then because of COVID. So then when I had this opportunity to show in South Minneapolis, all of a sudden I was like, this is the place to do it because uh, it's because of the George Floyd, uh, the unrest, everything that happened in my neighborhood. I felt I wanted to do this exhibition here in Minneapolis and in my neighborhood. Uh, and it was one of the few galleries that stayed open during COVID. So uh, it's called Hair and Nails. It's an alternative gallery. They're very enthusiastic, wonderful people to work with. Um, uh, but anyway, I probably did an overly ambitious exhibition in, in a very small space. So you can see the some of just the overview. So here's another dye sublimation print. Uh, this one's tamarisk, uh, which is um, it's a type of tree. And in, so in 2019, I went, I traveled again to California uh, to go to Desert X, uh, which is a festival in the desert where uh, you you have to travel great distances to see these um, wonderful sculptures uh, placed in the environment. Uh, and I was very interested in that aspect of uh, sort of artworks existing in this very inhospitable space. Um, so uh, this one, the Tamarisk I saw at the Salton Sea where they actually had a few sculptures on display uh, in that area. And um, 
but what was interesting about the tamarisk was um, that it was slated for removal. You know, so th this was at the visitor center and it was the most beautiful thing there. It was full of butterflies. The painted ladies were just, they had had a, a rainy season. So there were a lot of painted lady butterflies everywhere. Um, and it was just this gorgeous uh, object thing, living thing. And, uh, um, but the visitor center had on their uh, brochure, it said, um, eight invasive tamarisk trees, tamarisk ramosissima, will be removed from the view shed of the Salton Sea Visitor Center. Staff will utilize hand saws and loppers to cut the tamarisk, then treat the stumps with an application of garland floor ultra. All biomass will be transported to the park boneyard, staged there for six to four, 12 months, then disposed of. So just a kind of uh, relationship of humans to nature. I thought this got at that the tension between those things because you know we are dictating what lives, what doesn't. Uh, I was hoping to show this in motion because all these works are activated by by the wind, and actually because of COVID, they had these air purifying systems, these air extractors in every gallery. So the works were actually flowing constantly. Um, and because I'm, I'm presenting with um, a PDF, I wasn't able to get the PowerPoint to work. I, um, it's not seamless to jump to video. So I'm, I'm not gonna show as much video as I had hoped. <laughs> but, um, but just imagine they are animated beyond just being on fabric. The movement is quite dramatic. Uh, these are all two lava prints, and then um, the other one is of, uh, well, I'll jump to it in a second here. Here's a detail. I decided to include the, the fern in the small gallery because um, the, it is one of the plants that first starts to sprout from when the lava actually cracks open. So it just, um, it's one of the earliest um, plants to, to, to come up and re basically recreate dirt. <laughs> it's like help erode. Uh, this, is, um, this, th uh, this print was done on also dye sublimation, but it's on um, chiffon. So it's this kind of shimmery, uh, stiff fabric. And it's based on a slide that my father took in the Patagonia when I was a child. Uh, so my father was an amateur photographer, you know, very serious, like he, he followed Ansel Adams' zone system, and we always had a dark room. And um, and he, um, but he would also shoot color slides. Uh, so I I decided to use I borrowed some of his slides that have been kind of stored for years, um, and wanted to include something prehistoric, to sort of to to create the, to think about humans' relationship to time, and. Um, it, and so these uh, these handprints are actually uh, prehistoric um, stencils, uh, like the native Tehuelche would uh, use a bone to spray like airbrush around their hands. And and these the, it's called the Cave of Hands, and it's in the Patagonia. It's a beautiful site. It has hundreds of these uh, very vivid hands all over the place. So I'm including my father in this installation, um, in part thinking about uh, the, the reason I wanted to include him was to think about sort of the difference between human lifespan versus um, versus deep time and like na like nature time and or even planetary time. Uh, thinking about you know how the brevity of our time here makes us kind of blind to to distant future distant past. Um, so these are kind of reveries about uh, that issue. Uh, this is a shelf that was next to the chair. You'll see maybe the context. Uh, but uh, so it's an image uh, of a photograph of myself and my siblings as children. There's a petrified piece of wood that my mother and father collected, uh, a boleadora, which is a hand carved stone um, that was used by the native Tehuelche and then later gauchos also use them. Um, aviator sunglasses uh, with one lens replaced with obsidian 
Uh, so volcanic glass, uh, and then um, a group of uh, br cast bronze styrofoam packing peanuts. So I was thinking of this as, as the human detritus we might leave behind, in, like a future fossil of sorts. Um, and I'll talk about some of these individual pieces. Uh, so this would have also been a picture my father took of us in the Patagonia. Um, this is from 1972, and we're sitting on a petrified log eating lunch, basically. So it's, uh, I'm in the front right here. And here is the obsidian sunglasses. Uh, this, um, uh, James Rose, uh, a graduate student in who was working in glass, really a pro with the grinder. <laughs> she helped me like shape uh, obsidian that I had collected in uh, at Mammoth Lakes uh, or near Mammoth Lakes. Um, they, it was all over the place. There was rocks of obsidian everywhere. And there's a site called Obsidian Dome that's really beautiful. It's an it's a old volcanic well, basically the the dome of the old volcano, and it's got it's all obsidian. Um, but that's not where I collected it. I, you could collect it everywhere else. Um, so the, the and the for me the uh, the aviator sunglasses became like a metaphor of our inability to see far. It's like we're but also an attempt. Like how do you communicate with deep time? How do, what, what, what does that look like? And so it's, it's, um, it's more of a pun than, um, you know, you, you can't really see through the obsidian. I, I could have polished it so that you could. This is actually also a, a representative of COVID interruption. Um, like initially I did, I had one uh, sunglass that had the two lenses made out of obsidian, uh, but one cracked a little bit. And so then I found this other pair of uh, eyeglasses and was working towards getting the two obsidian parts. And then uh, with COVID, I ended up back in Minneapolis. I didn't have access to the facilities at Alfred anymore. So, so it, I, it ended up being one piece, the original glass and one uh, with the obsidian, which is actually kind of interesting because uh, one, a writer who, who wrote a piece for art papers about this show, uh, he talks about how during the unrest in Chile, um, uh, like the, the police were intentionally blinding people. They were shooting rubber bullets at people's eyes, in, including journalists. And about a dozen people suffered, you know, permanent eye loss. Um, so it was kind of a terrorizing tactic. And, but so um, this, uh, this writer uh, interpreted the sunglasses as being sort of this eye patch because uh, people would wear eye patches in solidarity, like uh, in solidarity of those who had lost eyes. It's really a tragic situation. Um, this is a boleadora and I'll read a little bit about, because they're kind of interesting objects. Um, so we can find it here. So bolas, sometimes they're called bolas, boleadores, um, are a type of throwing weapon made of weights on the ends of interconnected rawhide cords used to capture animals by entangling their legs. So usually you would, you would have two and then a long uh, strand of rawhide or some kind of rope. Um, Argentine gauchos learned to use them from indigenous people uh, to hunt guanaco and ñandú. Ñandú are the small kind of ostriches that um, are all over Patagonia. In Chile, the Mapuche deployed bolas against the Spanish cavalry during the uh, sorry, uh, during the 236-year War of Arauco. Uh, and this is interesting. Uh, it was interesting to me because um, I Concepcion sits right at the border of the Bio Bio region, which is this estuary that's. It's this wide, very wide river and uh, that opens into the Pacific and it's incredibly wide. So the, the native Mapuche were able to uh, forestall conquest for 236 years longer than everything everywhere else. So it was kind of this, uh, so it's a very, uh, the indigenous community is still very strong there, but has been fighting um, conquest ever since. 
even, you know, I mean, it eventually was conquered, but it's still being uh, exploited. Uh, so back in California, um, this image is of, it's called, it's a petroglyph called 13 moons. I, for me, it was like the most amazing petroglyph I've ever seen. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, it represents the lunar calendar. And um, I was thinking about how um, these, like that this native group would have known these technologies or would have had an understanding of uh, the moon and its cycles. And, um, but that, that there's not a memory of that in the present moment. It's sort of, um, we sort of forget. It feels like every civilization has to reinvent it a new way or something. And so there's no, not, instead of learning from each other and having cumulative knowledge, it feels like it's always this reinvention. Uh, this, I'm not gonna show the video, I don't think, uh, just because of time, but um, this is uh, this uh, video, it's called El País de No Me Acuerdo, and it's, um, so the, the country of, I don't remember. And um, it's, my father uh, was born in Argentina. He's the son of Ukrainian immigrants. Uh, he worked as a surgeon uh, in the United States and Argentina. Um, and as I mentioned, he was an autodidact black and white photographer. And then after he retired, he learned olivicultura, which is um, olive growing. So he's been tending to an olive grove for 26 years in Argentina. And um, I visited, so uh, when, I mean, a little later I'll show, um, you know, well, I showed the image of the tank at the beginning. That's from my trip, my most recent trip to, Ch to Chile. And on that same trip in January of 2020, uh, I always visit my father because it's, I'm in South America. Um, and uh, so this was shot also during that trip. So they're kind of these opposing situations. One is very insular, my father growing old in his olive orchard, tending to trees and, and the unrest in Chile um, and, and all that it, um, all the mayhem that it um, represents. Um, as part of the exhibition, um, this was an, one of the inspiring, um, an inspiring moment that led me to want to do the obsidian sunglasses and to think of, and it made me think about my father. And it's this uh, Methuselah, it's called Methuselah. It's this ancient bristlecone pine tree. And even though it looks dead, it's actually alive. It's, it's one of the oldest living beings on the planet, um, or it's believed to be the oldest, but who knows. Um, it's about 5,000 years old. Um, and uh, I was just amazed, like the park rangers hide the location of it because they don't want all the Instagram influencers showing up and taking selfies. And I was thinking about that how photographers, you know, we spend like a few seconds in front of something like a bristlecone pine and that's 5,000 years old. And I was trying to think about what it has experienced. I mean, it was around when the Paiute were drawing the 13 moons, the lunar calendar. Um, they might've sat under that tree. So I was just, the, the I was interested in how um, easily we forget to try to be in the present with these um, or to understand these other beings. And I always imagine like that maybe they do have information and knowledge that some they will know, or hopefully we can um, learn from them somehow, uh, but we fail to. Um, so when I was at that residency at uh, Mammoth Lakes, I lived on, in an A-frame cabin. It was like a cedar A-frame cabin from the 60s. Um, and when I was living there, I'll, I'll jump. So I made this ashtray. It's basically a collaboration between a woodpecker, a birch log, uh, you know, I, I found a bronze uh, little ashtray. And then the pipe just represents, you know, it's because my father used to smoke a pipe. But um, I'll show you the woodpecker next here. So, so this woodpecker, uh, it's actually a Northern flicker. Uh, it would wake me up at seven every morning and it had carved two perfect circles, uh, one on each side. So an entrance and an exit. And I was just fascinated 
by how it had appropriated, you know, the tree, the, the tree as plank as home. Um, and then, so I wanted to appropriate something that it had, that had belonged to, to woodpecker and make my own object. And, um, and so the, the ashtray became sort of an ironic version of, of this um, commentary about how we treat nature. Um, and so it's a collaboration between the woodpecker, myself, and, and the birch tree. Um, also at the cabin, um, it, on the mantle, there was this, um, this carved um, uh, German saying, uh, which, um, let me find it here, but it, um, Basically, it, I, 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 my German's terrible, so I'm not going to try to pronounce it. But, um, but it's a German script, and it, 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 was, it just says, to each his own forever friends. And uh, we had long discussions about it with some of the curators that were there and, and other, other artists, and just trying to decipher what it meant. Um, and um, later, when I was working on the Astra, I decided to incorporate it. Uh, because it felt like of it, the moment, you know, when we're trying to consider, everyone's taking sides politically. It's like, you're with me or you're against me. And so I was thinking about this saying, and uh, I also uh, wanted to carve something on this log, much like the, the worms or, you know, little ants and, you know, maybe termites had carved also the wood. So it's sort of a collaboration with all these other animals. Okay. Uh, when I was in Argentina um, visiting my father, uh, I, I noticed, uh, you know, he, he like he was fixing these patio chairs. I, I actually had found this patio chair is falling apart. It's like a like a very cheap pool kind of patio chair, and uh, he's been there twenty six years with all the same things that he took there from the U.S. Uh, so he he brought all his things and has repaired them ever since. And um, if you look carefully, you can see that every single chair has been repaired several times. <laughs> and so I was inspired by this. I thought, oh, this is amazing that, um, he, you know, he finds the strapping and often it doesn't match, but, but he's, he, he dedicates himself to, to making sure it stays um, whole, that it continues to live another day. So I was, I thought that was really inspiring. And so I wanted to make something that was, would represent that and be in his homage, an homage to him sharing um, his love of, like his curiosity for learning new skills. And um, I just thought uh, I wouldn't be who I am if he hadn't just jumped in and done whatever came to, you know, whatever he wants to learn, he just does it. Uh, so I um, decided I was going to make a chair, uh, and I went on YouTube and found, uh, I decided on an Acapulco chair, which are these kind of, and the reason I decided on that chair is that there was one at the residency. And I, at first I thought, oh, maybe I'll, I wanted to include a chair with the ashtray. And I was like, but then I was like, oh, I shouldn't, if I buy one, it just seems kind of weird uh, and meaningless other than contributing to global economics. Uh, so um, I, I was like, I'm going to go to the source, see if there's someone that, because it, it originally it was designed in Mexico. It's Acapulco chair. Uh, and I found Jose Rios, who's this uh, fabricator, Mexican fabricator, who posted several YouTube videos. And um, so there's one on how to weld the chair and the other one how to weave it. And he also has a, uh, others on how to make a, like a little kid's version. And he gives you kind of the, uh, the drawings with the dimensions. I mean, it's, some of it I had to kind of wing, but because um, it wasn't totally exact, but, uh, but it's very good instructions. Anyway, so I was able to follow along and, and make my own. Um, and for me, this one, I wanted it to represent my father. So I, instead of using the plastic or the PVC that normally gets used, I, I used leather. For me, this represents Argentina very clearly, especially in, this, in the 60s, 70s, when my father would have been a fairly young man smoking a pipe. So um, I wanted it to be the patriarch, 
you know, this chair is sort of represents the family patriarch. Um, okay, and that was, I don't know if, if in the installation shot, there was a shot where you saw the chair and the ashtray just, I, I, I forgot to put a second shot of that. Uh, Schadenfreude, this is the, when it was in progress, it's where it's just based it on, but um, the, the flag, it's German again. Um, and it's, the meaning is uh, Schadenfreude is the word for taking pleasures in others' misfortune. And um, I'll just read a little bit. This word came into focus through President uh, Trump's presidency through whose tenure exposed the deep-seated racism inherent in the American experiment. A visual schadenfreude permeates many art objects. In the era of climate change, the pleasure one gets from modernist objects, such as leather-strapped Acapulco chair, comes into conflict with the resources uh, required to build one. So it's been thinking about the markets that um, required to sort of get a hold of steel, for example, or, or even the pain of the animal uh, required to for leather. It's like, um, okay, this, oh, well, actually, no, I, I'll show a few more and then maybe I'll take a little uh, hiatus for a little break for uh, questions. Although I guess time's running short. I might only have time for this one. Okay, so Casa Poli. Um, in 20, uh, 2012 and 2013, I visited, um, Chile, and so I had met artists from being there in 2005, and some of these artists eventually ended up running a, a, a residency, and they invited me to apply, and I applied and, and got to go, And um, but it was located in a similar area, but on the Pacific, um, and it was, uh, basically, it was a minimalist uh, cultural art center that was designed by architects Mauricio Peso and Sofia Ehrlichhausen. They're like a, a, a dual you know, couple who um, do beautiful architectural spaces. Um, and the residency program was established in an effort to stimulate critical thought and experimental art in the Bio Bio region of Chile. Um, so this is a very remote, like they actually are consciously trying to bring culture to this more remote area. The amazing thing about some of the artists in Concepcion are that they're they're very interested in uh, bringing things locally. Like they don't they don't want to just go to Santiago to this cosmopolitan city. They're they're trying to actually create culture in their own environment and include that includes indigenous uh, groups and uh, the Bio Bio region is known for its indigenous roots. So while I was there, I went in 2012 through and 2013, I went twice. Um, but when I was there, I uh, part of my duties consisted of taking care of these stray dogs. Uh, so one of them had been inherited from the cement layer I, or the, the, the cement person had somehow left their dog and the other dogs were just sort of strays that, you know, they don't get fixed and so they breed and so the, there was a mother and a couple of her pups and some other dogs but there was five of them and the residency the people running the residency said you know as part of the residency we ask that you feed the dogs while you're here and so i i bought dog food and twice a day i would feed them and they lived outside but they would follow me on all my walks i, I always had like five dogs with me and in Chile, this is kind of acceptable, like this sort of, um, it's almost like people talk endearingly about the stray dog as if it's representative of the culture, yet you see kind of some that suffer greatly, others that have really uh, are luckier and someone takes care of them regularly. So, so they have to fend for themselves quite a bit of the time. Um, like when no one's at Casa Poli, there was no one, they had to go to the village and just try to scavenge. They had different places they would go to to try to find food or they would hunt or scavenge. Um, so that was a, an awakening, uh, living with these dogs. Also, I became part of the pack. Um, they would follow me, they look up to me as the alpha, um, but I learned that if, if I wasn't aggressive and um, forceful, 
like if I showed any submission, uh, then the alpha, the actual alpha dog would uh, lunge at me and try to, you know, try to assert his power. So, so there was definitely an um, entanglement there that I had to learn. Um, I'm showing that that's sort of like going back and I'm coming back to the present and to the current show. So um, that experience with the dogs made me want to return to Chile this more recently, like when I went in 2020. And my plan was to follow these dogs. I wanted to follow the stray dogs, see where they went, kind of do a, um, a piece, a video piece that was about them. Um, as it turned out, before I even traveled there, the unrest happened. So there was in November, um, fair hikes resulted in this massive unrest um, that were related to actual um, historic ills and, and you know, people were, it was becoming harder and harder to make ends meet for, for the majority of people. So people are very unhappy with a lot of the current government policies. Um, a lot of liberal, which uh, they have very similar sort of neoliberal policies that have been used in the US. It's like where you have to pay for school, you have to pay for healthcare, you have to pay for everything. And so people just were, couldn't afford it and were pretty, um, it was like a massive plebiscite of uh, unrest. So Negro Matapacos, this dog, this particular dog, um, became the mascot of the unrest. And the reason, I'm um, oh, sorry, let's go back to that. The reason it became the, the mascot was that um, the dogs would, whenever they saw a pack of people, they would join in and they would charge forward and attack the police or, or try to defend the protesters from the police and they would bark and, and they would always be in the front of the line. And, but it's what dogs do, right? They, 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 they see a pack and they wanna join in, they think it's exciting. And, but this particular dog um, uh, had been a participant in protests for many years and died of natural causes in 2017. But then with the unrest in 2019, 2020, uh, he became the mascot. So there were murals everywhere of the dog. People carried placards with the dog's face. And, and then every stray dog became sort of like Matapacos, which means Blackie cop killer. So that was just a nickname. I mean, he hadn't actually killed a cop, but, um, but the mascot sort of, uh, so I was interested in sort of that allyship of non-human allyship um, with an animal and human. Um, so with the exhibition that I was just talking about, um, in the basement, I included some of these flags that were inspired. So I did the George Floyd flag and then continued to make flags. I made the schadenfreude and then uh, this is a, a Negro Matapacos flag. This one, it has the actual text embroidered um, with the name of the dog. Um, and 2019 BCV, um, the BCV is like a text, um, sort of common text way of referring to before coronavirus. So I, I wanted to create a marker of how nature has sort of you know, created a marker of, a historical marker of things before COVID, things after COVID. So, um, and that's why I included the caduceus, which is the symbol for medicine. Um, and here, this is the Negro Matapacos flag. Uh, it's embroidered. And I wanted it to have a funeral kind of quality and, and the qualities of a dog. So the embroidery is very furry-like and um, canine-like. And then um, the, a dual projection video uh, was included also. And um, it, these are asynchronous videos, but they both refer to Basically, they're all about the dogs, following the dogs through the unrest. Um, I, it, it was inevitable. I couldn't avoid uh, the unrest. It was everywhere. So, uh, which was something unexpected, but it turned out uh, quite compelling in the way that the dogs uh, responded to, to this activity and were always in the front line. Um, so the and the videos have mostly a natural sound. I'm gonna play a little bit. I don't wanna, um, I know we're running out of time, but um, I'll play a little bit of the video so you can get a sense of it. 
uh, I think it's worth checking out. And let's see, I'm gonna have to open it separately though. Just wanna start it at a spot and let it run a little bit. Um, I think I had it at 12. Yeah, this is pretty good. I'm using this special uh, square that I have to stretch here. And I don't know how well the sound will play. Hopefully it'll be all right. Is the sound working okay? No? <laughs> um, it's a little glitchy. Okay, I've had a feeling it might be. Um, I don't know if this is the best way to transmit it, but were you able to make out some of it or? Yeah? <laughs> a little bit. Uh, oh, okay. I, okay, so I won't play more of that then. I'm just gonna uh, wrap up here by showing one more thing. Um, uh, okay. I see more than I want, but that's okay. Okay, so uh, the the uh, Cthulhu scene um, is a um, a word that was made up by the theorist uh, Donna Haraway uh, in her book *Staying with the Trouble*, but. Um, it, it, it's, you know, she describes it as, as this awful and inviting, a tentacled earth figure, neither good or bad, representing the ongoing cross species entanglement and collective world making during the Capitalocene. So Cthulhu is, um, is also a frightening tentacled entity in H.P. Lovecraft's science fiction story by the same name. So Haraway's uh, Cthulhu scene encounters the patriarchal doomsday pessimism and human centric term Anthropocene. I wanted to, I kind of want to end with that um, and just show you one final flag that I've been, that I did. Um, I'm, I've been working on a lot of flags. I have like 20. So these are just a few, but um, this one, uh, I wanted to uh, sort of make a reference to the uh, bat pangolin sort of uh, hybrid and uh, how human encroachment into animal territory is starting to create problems for humans also. And, um, and, and sort of kind of like in the Cthulhu scene where we're gonna have to think about that and uh, work in allyship with other animals and other living beings in a way that maybe we're not considering fully. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think uh, I've I left three minutes, so. <laughs> Thank you.
that work? Okay, yes. So thank you very much, Alexa. Um, I think I have set it now to allow people to unmute themselves if they want to, to ask a question. Or uh, if anyone has a question and, want, and would like to just type it in the chat area, I'm happy to relay the question to you. Yeah, um, I can see the chat too. Okay, all right. Um, I see we have a, someone with a hand up. So um, I'm gonna let, uh, looks like Andrew has a question. Hi, um, I just, I was fascinated by the obsidian sunglasses and I was just thinking about how obsidian was used like a long, long, long time ago by indigenous tribes for like arrowheads. And, but, and then this day and age, it's like used for surgical mm -hmm. um, scalpels. And did you think about the materials as like how they can be so easily like transformed into different technologies throughout the age? Um, I, I was, you know, I actually, um, kind of I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm definitely, I'm often exploring, um, you know, like unusual materials and I wasn't able to show the, show the range of my work because I, what, is this okay? I'm getting, a, I'm sorry, I'm getting feedback, but, um, it should be okay. Yeah. But, um, so, um, the, uh, yeah, so the Maya supposedly uh, from, things I've read is that they used it to, to look at the eclipse of the sun. So they think they would have used them as a filter uh, because the slivers, when they're polished and thin, you can actually, they're kind of translucent. So I, I thought that was fascinating. And that gave me the idea of this aviator sunglasses. But because my purpose was um, to convey the idea of our blindness, I was okay with leaving it opaque. I, you know, I wasn't, that wasn't my goal to make it perfectly functional <laughs> you know it was more about oh yeah this one's different it's subsidian um, but yes I knew the surgical use it's a really fascinating material it would be it would be a great material to explore further star I think Where's that I, I think someone's sorry gonna... I can't oh. mute Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering if, like, while attending all these protests, um, if you would consider yourself to be an activist or an artist first, like, while attending those? Uh, definitely. Um, that, you know, I, that was an interesting... Um, I, I kept questioning my role there uh, because I, I, I really... My plan was to follow these dogs and... I, the protest happened after I had planned the trip and everything. So, but, um, but I was fast, I mean, I also have friends that I care for deeply there. And so they often would, I would often go with them. And another aspect that I didn't mention that's really important is that I collaborated with a young man. Uh, so my, my friend, Leslie Fernandez, who I've known for years and ran uh, the residency at Casa Poli, Unfortunately, it, it ended, like they ran it for about seven years and then it just got to be too much. But um, they, so she teaches at the University of Concepcion and one of her students um, happened to be doing portraits of stray dogs and like little paintings. They're really lovely. And, um, and so when I, I spent uh, like a couple weeks documenting, I also managed to get a little bit sick. So I wasn't able to, do as much as I had hoped. And, um, and so I, I had taken a GoPro with me and I was like, is there someone that might be able to shoot some footage for me? And um, I, I'll lend them the GoPro and they can use it for other things too. And this young skateboard kid, uh, he was 18, art student. He, um, he was already interested in the stray dogs and was like, oh, I need to take pictures of the stray dogs so I can paint them. And so, uh, so basically he carried the camera around and the most, so he was going into the more uh, intense situations. Like, cause in my video, uh, there's some encounters where, you know, the, there's water cannons about to shoot water at the protesters and there's protesters running and there's all kinds of clashes. And um, so I, I mean, I, I wasn't, 
convinced that I was the right person to be in that because um, not because of, I mean, it's dangerous for one, but it was more like for him, all, all these young people were going every day to, they would just go to the protest naturally. It wasn't like he was gonna go regardless of whether he had a camera or not. And I felt it would be more an authentic portrait. And he was, and he had that interest and care for the dogs. And so I, I gave him a list of sort of, um, you know, criteria of how I wanted him to shoot, you know, and like, like what, what speed and like what angles to, to try to shoot at. Cause it was about, and it was interesting cause when you're, when you start to follow the dogs, then you're kind of like, you're in it, but you're also sideways in it because you're not, you're not looking at the hole as much. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, yeah, in a way, I'm a, I'm an artist. I, I, I would say I'm an artist first, and that, um, but it felt conflicted to be witnessing that that the unrest and the the pain. You know, it it was incredible, um, and it was hard. Um, you know, at I, like I also it was also hard following and watching some of the dogs. I have footage of a dog that was living in a trash heap. That it was just heartbreaking. I wanted to bring him home. You know. Um, so yeah, it, it, but yes, artists first, I think. Any other questions? I'm not sure if there are any other questions yet. If anyone has one, they can also raise their cyber hand or type something <laughs> in the chat. I, I was struck by a couple of things in your talk that I, I don't think I, I knew. Um, you know, as I said in my introduction, you know, you seem like someone who takes on all kinds of different media. I've seen you make paintings, photographs, sculptures. You know, you learned how to make this chair. And um, it was interesting to me that you sort of described your dad the same way, that he was this sort of autodidact who figured out how to do whatever it was that he wanted to do. So it, is that where that sort of side of your, your artistic persona uh, developed, do you think? I think so. I, my father, I mean, he's a, you know, he's a complicated person in that, you know, he basically has always done what he wanted. Like at age 18, he went on some several week horseback ride. And, and then after that, he always wanted to go back to Argentina and own a ranch. You know, he wanted to have horses and, and he, he had horses for a while in like just a couple horses and a couple cows, you know, in Missouri while he was a doctor. And he would just go on weekends and, you know, do the farm thing. And, you know, as teenagers, we didn't want anything to do with it. Um, it, it was boring, you know, like, we're just like, we don't want to do this. But, but yes, he would just uh, pursue all these things like, you know, woodworking and um, kind of uh, no fear, go at it, you know, um, and had many lives, like, you know, like just has been tending on Olive Archer so long now and that yet was a surgeon, like even after he moved to Los Moges, it's amazing. Like, so he had this big German shepherd for a while that was kind of almost wolf-like and the German, and it would be kind of aggressive. And one time it, it brought down a small deer like and tore its uh, sort of skin. And my dad sewed it back together. <laughs> so like, you know, so he's using his surgical skills in the, you know, <laughs> with the animals. So, I mean, there's just something, um, yeah, um, very passionate, you know, about the things he pursues. Like he, he's a real believer. Um, but I also would say that it's a Argentinian quality, like the kind of DIY. Um, mm -hmm. It's a necessity almost because you know, my brother has been living there now for a year, uh, helping my dad. And, um, and he, it's, you just can't find, um, you know, the, the, the economics there are such that you, it's difficult to get a hold of things sometimes. Like, and so you do make things last forever. You don't, you do not want to replace something that still works with something that might not work, you know? <laughs> so, so there's this, there's this necessity to fixing and, and you know, and, um, and there's not that many, you know, like everyone just has to do it themselves basically. So, yeah. so there's a lot of people like him, I think there, you know. Right. Yeah. 
And then the, the other thing I was thinking in your talk, I mean, you, as you said, you've been making all these flags and I'm a big fan of art flags, so I really like yeah. them, but um, I, I'm just sort of wondering if there was a particular drive towards flags. Cause I mean, one of the things that's been striking me in the last, you know, several years um, under the previous administrations, there all these people with flags about their political identity all over the place there's you know and especially here in upstate new york driving through the catskills there are people who've like bought 12 flag poles <laughs> put all their political flags on you know and it, right. it seems like a new behavior like i don't remember everyone <laughs> like pledging allegiance to their political party in that kind of way right. yeah yeah well, yeah go ahead but there's something about that that seems to be like the language of a, a certain kind of politics right now, the, the, the flag, you know? And mm -hmm. so it's interesting like to see you using these flags that are also about politics. Yeah, I, um, I'm i trying to make them, I mean, it, it, for me, it was George, the death of George Floyd really was the catalyst um, in, in that I, I enjoyed make, like, it sort of brought me satisfaction to make it, even though it was such a painful situation. Um, but after that, I was like, oh, the, I like this. I like this as a sort of mode or of working. And, um, and it made me think of um, almost like creating a, like the Masons will have their sort of narrative of who they are, you know, <laughs> like right. everything that represents their beliefs or, and so I wanted to make a narrative about the Anthropocene or, the Cthulhu scene is, as I see it, actually, the, the Cthulhu flag is kind of a central piece as far as I, for me, in right. that I think it'll help define all these other ideas uh, that then will get inter interconnected. So it's almost like I'm creating a storyline and I hope to show them together sometime, but you know, it's just, um, for this show, I just decided to choose the dog ones because they were specific to that project. Um, and that is something I do. I tend to reuse objects. I, um, I sometimes, you know, they, they sort of merge, one project merges, merges into the other. And so sometimes I'll reuse objects or I'll keep going with certain ideas from one object to the, one project to the next. Right. Kind of. And it's funny, I, as I said, I really like flags and so on uh, as aesthetic objects, but it, it's funny that you mentioned the Masons too, because I also collect <laughs> stuff. I, I collect, we, we have one right here. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> I yeah. collect the Eastern Star, the women's division of the Masons, their dishware, all oh, it's this like crazy symbol system, you know? Um, and there is something about that, like it's it suggests a whole narrative or a whole worldview or something. Right. And it's also kind of bonkers, and I, I kind of like that. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's like, it's like the memento mori. I feel like the, the they really are good at getting at that sort of death and the skull right. and this, um, which I, I've always loved. I, I love the sort of, you know, the memento mori paintings and, right. the, you know, this reminder of her, the fleetingness of life. And so, yeah, I, I just, it just sort of fits, um, I love language too. I've been writing a lot. So I think I have all these, and I feel like politics, all the bombardment of, uh, of information, right? It's, it's often like hashtags or like, I wanna do one that's be water, which is the Hong Kong hashtag for how, yeah. to, you know, how to behave uh, during, you know, to be effective as activists, right? Where there's no leader, it's the Bruce Lee, Thing, right. water. <laughs> so I love those connections to popular culture or to um, history and yeah, and yeah, story making kind of. Great. I mean, that, that probably helps explain a lot of why <laughs> the work resonates <laughs> a lot with me. Um, so we're over time at this yeah. point, which yeah, is thanks. fine with me, but I just want to make sure if there are any other questions from the students or anyone else on the call before we wrap up. Yeah, I just got a, a comment from Katharina. Oh, uh-huh, right. yeah. Yeah, she just said a, a comment. She said, thank you for the presentation. Uh, that reveals the connection of your personal life, family story to your artistic work and political perspective on the world. It rings true. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have to say, this is one of my most uh, sort of personal 
you know, where I, I inserted myself and my family way more than I usually do. Um, but I think it's the moment we're living. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, everybody. I, I really appreciate your patience and uh, taking Thank the time. You. I'm really glad we managed to make this work a, a year later. And yeah, super. good to see you and catch up a bit at the beginning there. Yeah, good luck with the end of the semester. All see right. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.